Hey, we're going to get into it. My name is Shane, and tonight I'm going to be preaching and teaching about how to win the war in your head. If you know anything about spiritual warfare, or if you have been a human for longer than one year, you know that life will take a toll on your mind, that just issues and trials and fires and, and things that happen, they wear on your mind. And I am going to help you tonight to always win the war in your mind. So this is a very important teaching. This is probably one of my favorite topics to teach on and one of the most important topics that I could teach on. Because if you win this war in your mind, you will not give in. And when people give in is when they begin to spiral, when they begin to fall into deep depression, not just, uh, you know, like a, like a lighter depression. I'm talking about a deep depression into despair, into hopelessness. And that leads many people to take their own lives. I believe that this teaching tonight can help set you free from despair, from anguish, from hopelessness. So listen, if that's you already, I want you to just confess in the comments. There's something that happens when you confess and you come out of agreement with whatever you're walking through. You're saying, hey, this is not my identity, but I'm experiencing this. So if that's you, I want you just to say, that's me. If you're struggling with your mind, if you're struggling with thoughts of depression or anxiety or suicide even, I want you to say, that's me right now in the comments because I want you to engage with me right from the get-go. I want you to confess. See, look at these comments. That's me. That's me. I'm in a severe depression. That's exactly what's going on with me. That's me. Guys, this teaching matters and it's needed. And you know what? It's very simple. So I'm not going to demean your situation. I don't mean to say anything that like... um you know, discounts what you're going through. I'm just telling you that the solution is very easy. Everyone pause for one minute. Jamie Page. Jamie Page says, I confess suicide, I'm so close. We're gonna stop and pray. Anyone else dealing with suicide, we're gonna pray for you. Uh, before I even begin to teach. If you're watching this later on YouTube and you're suicidal, I want you just to open your hands up and I'm, I'm gonna pray over you as well. We're gonna pray right now. Father, I thank you for Jamie and every other person who's listening that is close to suicide, admittedly so. Lord, I ask that your spirit would come right now. Fill the room that Jamie and everyone else is in God, would you break through the heaviness and allow this word and your hope to penetrate their heart. I thank you that your word says that hope in you does not disappoint. And so for every person who's listening that has been disappointed with life and it has led them to depression or anxiety or suicide, Father, I thank you that those chains of bondage and that heavy yoke would be broken right now in Jesus' name. Give us ears to hear what you are saying tonight in Jesus' name. Every spirit of suicide, I bind you now and I command you to leave in Jesus' name. Guys, I wasn't even gonna start like this, but listen, if you're dealing with this, depression, anxiety, suicide, whatever, I want you to say out loud, say, I come out of agreement with suicide. I come out of agreement with depression. Just say it out loud right now. You're speaking to someone. You're speaking to an audience. The enemy is listening and watching and they want to see what you're going to do. And you tell them right now, you cannot have me. I give myself to the Lord. I come out of agreement with suicide and depression in Jesus name. And just say this, God, please help me tonight. Speak to me through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Wow, what a heavy start. I'm gonna tell you why your mind is like this pan. Now to lighten things up, uh, this is a hex clad pan. It's a very nice pan. I got it as a gift for Christmas, I think, or my birthday. Um, you know, it's one of those gifts where like, you can only ask for one at a time because, you know, that's pretty much your Christmas that year. But I love to cook and as a result of that, I got gifted a very nice pan. Now, do you think that I take good care of this thing? Do you think that like after I cook, say a steak or some chicken or something like that, when, when there's all the crud in the bottom, do you think that I just let it sit there? Like I don't put any water or dish soap in it. I don't clean it right away. Like, do you think I just leave it out? Let me ask you a question. And maybe you've heard this teaching before, but even Paul writes and he says, it's good for you to hear these things again, even though you know it and you're walking in it, you're established in it because it's a safeguard for you. Some of you have heard this teaching and I feel like there's even a couple of people you've said, oh, I've heard this before and you're getting ready to tune out but you still have problems in your mind. This is good for you to hear again, if you've never heard this. Take it in, take it in like it's the first time. I promise you, you can be free from just horrible, intrusive thoughts. What happens to a pan when you cook on it and you leave it out? Somebody tell me in the comments. What happens to the pan if any of you cook? Like if you were to cook a dish and then you just let the pan sit on the stove all night, what kind of mess are you waking up to in the morning? You are waking up to just hardened, crusted crap that is all over your pan. And how easy is it to clean, right? It is a pain. Some people are saying it stains the pan, it sticks to it, it gets harder to clean, exactly. It is horrific to try to clean and you're so frustrated at yourself or whoever left the pan out if it wasn't you, which hey, newsflash, you can always just step in and clean it even if you didn't cook. But the point is this, it's on there and while you're cleaning it, you're just like, man, if only I had dealt with it sooner. Okay, here's what happens in the war in your mind. The enemy is hurling accusations. The Bible says that he's shooting fiery darts. I don't know why I'm doing all these motions like I'm talking to some six-year-olds. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Just trying to keep it light maybe because it's gonna get heavy. The enemy is shooting fiery darts and those darts are accusations. He is the accuser of the brethren. Day and night, the Bible says that the enemy accuses. And some of you can testify to this. All of you should be able to testify to it because if you're you know, over six years old, you've probably heard the lies of the enemy. You can recognize, hey, the enemy's been taunting me. He's been accusing me. He's been condemning me. He's been uh, judging me, all of these things. That is his job. Now, here's what happens. When you don't, deal with the thoughts right away. Your mind is this pan and those accusations are food, you know, just for the sake of this demonstration, if you will. Now, if I let the accusations of the enemy pile up in this pan and I go, you know what? Ugh. I've just had such a hard day. I've had such a rough day. I've been dealing with all this stuff. I'm tired. I don't wanna to pray tonight. I don't want to deal with any of this. I just wanna turn my brain off and go watch the next episode of Survivor or go watch the next episode of Kitchen Nightmares or whatever your show is. Or I just wanna turn my brain off and scroll on my phone for a little bit and just go to bed and we'll try again tomorrow. Let me know in the comments how many of you are guilty of doing that when you've just had a rough day and there's things that are bothering you in your mind that you need to deal with. There's thoughts that you need to take to the Lord. You need to encourage yourself in truth, but you don't. 
You just say, you know what, I'm, I'm exhausted. Or, hey, I've been doing this for weeks and it's still happening. I'm getting tired. I'm just gonna go to bed tonight. How many of you have done that? Look at these comments. On YouTube, you can't see, I'll read a couple of them. They're saying every night, literally every evening, that's me, I'm guilty, that's me. These are the comments. Guys, let me tell you something. When you don't deal with what's in the pan, it doesn't disappear. How many of you, you ignored dealing with it at night and you woke up and it was all better? Anyone? Anyone ever encounter this situation where you've just got all these things that you need to deal with? You need to go to prayer. You need to take the thoughts captive like the Bible says. And you say, you know what? I'm too tired. I don't wanna do this tonight. I'm exhausted. I'm tired of warring in the spirit. I'm just gonna veg out. I'm just gonna watch TV. I'm just gonna scroll. I'm just gonna go to bed. And then you wake up in the morning and it's all better. No one. Because it's not how it works. You see, life just doesn't fix itself. Your problems don't look at the comments. Nope, never happens, has never happened to me. Your mind doesn't fix itself. You are responsible for your mind. There is a war happening in your mind, and guess what? If you don't fight in that war, the other party is not taking a ceasefire. If you stop fighting in the war in your mind, the enemy doesn't go, oh, what's that? We're gonna take the night off and we're just gonna watch TV? Okay, cool, hey, me too. No, the devil doesn't do that. The devil goes, oh, you're not fighting anymore? Perfect. Because I can't defeat a Christian who knows their identity and is walking in the power of God, but I can defeat a Christian who doesn't know their identity, or who doesn't even pray, who just lets me use them like a punching bag. If that's you, do you really need to wonder why you're having so many issues in your mind? Can I just say it plainly? If you don't deal with your thoughts, are you really surprised that you have a serious problem with your mind? Come on guys, this is easy. I'm here to sound the alarm in your life, to shake you awake and say, hey, you have let food pile up on your pan. Now, here's the kicker, right? You let the food pile up. Maybe you say, and you say it with you know, a, a level of sincerity, I'll deal with it in the morning, okay? I know it's gonna be a little harder, but I'm exhausted and I'll deal with it in the morning. Okay, then you get up in the morning and you go, oh, you know what, this is gonna take way longer than I thought, I'm not ready for this, I've got other things going on. I'll get to it later. What happens? It gets worse and worse and worse. Some of you neglect your dishes or your trash and it piles up. And all of a sudden you get overwhelmed because now you have too many and you don't even know where to begin. And so instead of beginning and chipping away at it, you just throw your hands up and now you've got a serious problem. Am I talking to one person? I believe you have a problem with hoarding and it is a, a reflection of what's happening on the inside. I feel like we've got a hoarder uh, on here. I've never had that word of knowledge before. I believe that we have one person on here, genuinely you deal with hoarding. If that's you, uh, just say that's me. There's absolutely no judgment. We're gonna pray for you. But it is a result of what's happening on the inside and it's just manifesting itself on the outside. Well, when you don't deal with your thoughts, you're hoarding the thoughts of the enemy. You're hoarding lies. You see, here's why. Because the enemy is speaking all the time. I mean, I've talked about this with intrusive thoughts. You know, you have a crazy thought. You know, I was at the store and I had a thought of like throwing a piece of fruit across the, the produce section. There we go. There's the, the person. Paris says, that's me. There's two people on here saying that's me. They have a hoarding problem. Okay, hey, thank you for your honesty and we will pray with you and for you, but this message is going to help set you free. 
So you can have thoughts, you can have crazy thoughts. I've shared this before, I was driving down the street and I just had a random thought, you should drive your car off the road and kill yourself. And I was like, why would I do that? You see, that's not my thought. It is a suggestion from the enemy because the enemy and demons are real, but you can't see them, but you can hear them. Think about it, Jesus talked with Satan, but Jesus could see him. You know, Satan is still talking. The Bible says that the, the stranger, the enemy has a voice, but us as Christians are not supposed to uh, find it familiar because we are supposed to be following God. But it does mean that we can hear the voice and the accusations and the lies of the enemy, but we have to understand that it is not our thought. Let me tell you right now, if you are a Christian, you cannot be possessed by a demon. If you are a born again Christian, you have been bought, purchased, filled and sealed by God with his Holy Spirit. You cannot be possessed, ownership. Now you can be oppressed, which means stuff happening from the outside, but there is nothing possessing you running your life. Are you understanding me? So your, your identity is always, I am a son, I am a daughter of the most high God, I belong to him, I'm his prized possession, I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now if you're dealing with intrusive thoughts, you're dealing with just horrible things, right? Thoughts that things are never gonna get better, you catastrophize everything, you just think everything's gonna be awful, you know, fill in the blank. You can be oppressed by a demon. It doesn't mean you have a demon, it doesn't mean you don't. What it means is that you're not possessed, you're, you're owned by God, are you getting this? So whether you're dealing with an oppression or whatever, the, the battle is the same. And here's the battle. Will you hold on to truth no matter what happens in your life? This is the story of Job. Hold on, let me block, block a hater really quick who doesn't wanna hear the gospel. Okay, now that that's dealt with, this is the, the story of Job. Satan knew if I can touch Job enough, he will curse God to his face. Now, Satan wasn't after Job's health or his money or his family or his resources. Satan was after Job's mind because the goal wasn't, I'm just gonna hurt Job because I like hurting people. No, Satan's goal is much bigger than that. Satan says, I'm going to hurt Job and he will curse God and walk away from God because nobody loves God. They love what God does for them. Are you with me? Do you think that Satan is doing the same thing tonight that he was doing thousands and thousands of years ago? Of course he is. Let me find someone on there. Luke, Luke Doc Agnor. Thanks for joining. You know what Satan is saying tonight? He's saying, Luke, you don't love God. You say you love God. You serve God because your life is good. But if your life were to become hard, if you were to lose some things, if you were to suffer in some way, you would no longer serve God. In fact, you would curse God to his face because you don't love God, because nobody loves God. People need God. They use God to get their lives to be better. But nobody truly loves God. Watch, I'll show you. I'll squeeze you. I'll poke you. I'll destroy you. And I'll destroy your family and relationships. And I'll take your money and I'll make you sick. And you will curse God. That's what the devil is saying tonight. Now, as Christians, we have the great privilege of standing on truth. Let me tell you how to win that war. Because how many of you know you could be serving God and you could say, God, I will never deny you. I'll never fall away. 
I will never curse you, Lord. Then you lose a family member. You go bankrupt. You, you lose your house. You're on the street now. Your, your wife or your husband leaves you or cheats on you or something awful. You, I mean, f your kid dies. Like, think about this. You know, these things happen to people. Are you still in this place? God, I will never stop serving you. Is that you? I'm just telling you that if there are situations that would cause you to question, doubt, and leave God, you need to deal with those. Because the enemy is sure that no matter how hard you confess or how much of a sold out believer you say you are, or believe you are, the enemy thinks you have a breaking point. And we're not talking about like some light issue here. I'm talking about your relationship with God. I know people that have walked away from God because their life got hard and God didn't answer their prayers. Can I ask you a question? Is God not answering one of your prayers worth going to hell over? Like, will you let yourself get so offended at God because he didn't answer your prayer the way you wanted him to that you'll just say, you know what? I don't even know if God's real. And now you are risking your eternity because you didn't get your way. Is it okay if I'm just honest tonight? We have to be in a place where we know how to beat the enemy. One, you've got to be dead to yourself. Now, I serve a God who loves me and who wants the best for my life, but he will allow me to go through things, to strengthen me, to mold me, to shape me, to prune me. He will allow me to go through things so that he can be glorified. It's not about my glory. It's about his I don't understand everything that he's doing. I know some things about his will and his character because of his word, but I don't understand all of the pieces that he's got working. And so at the end of the day, I have to say, Lord, I trust you. I'm dead to myself. God, I don't wanna have any rights to be offended or angry with you. If something happens that I don't understand, help me understand. Now, let me tell you what number two is. Number one is you have to be dead to yourself. Number two, you have to recognize the plan of the enemy. This is it. This is, it. This is the, the, the playbook right here. Listen, if you haven't heard anything else, listen to this. The enemy's number one goal is to get you to do what? Curse God. So what's the one thing that I won't do? Curse God. Okay, now... It's not easy to just say that. Peter learned this. Peter says, I'll die for you. And then he ends up cursing Jesus. He denied him with a curse the third time. Why? Because Peter was trying to stay alive. He wasn't dead to himself. He wanted to stay alive. You see how self gets in the way of totally following the Lord? So check this out. Number one, you've got to be dead to yourself. Lord, whatever happens to me, I believe you have the best for me. I don't fully understand everything, but I know you're working all things out for my good. And at the end of the day, I'm going to be in heaven when I die. So what can really happen to me? That's number one. Here's number two. The enemy wants you to curse God. So what do I say? Every day, I say, Lord, I thank you that it doesn't matter what happens to me today. I will never, ever, ever stop trusting in you. I don't care what happens. I don't care if the worst thing happens. I know that it wasn't you. This is where you have to draw a line. Job didn't even know that Satan was the one doing these things. Satan made it look like God. He made it look like fire came down from heaven. Like he was trying to get Job to think that God was cursing him so that he would curse God. And Job had integrity. 
Job, even thinking it was God, said, God, though you slay me, I'll still follow you. Can I tell you something? Job didn't have good theology. God wasn't slaying Job. In fact, God shows this because he talks to Satan and he says, you gave Job a reason to be mad at me and he still worshiped me. You lose. God wasn't doing the striking. We know today because of Jesus and his teachings that there is a devil out there. Jesus taught this. Why do you think Jesus said things like, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to bring life? He is showing the world, look, I am the visible image of an invisible God. I am the son of our father in heaven, and this is what he's like. He brings life. Our friend who is suicidal right now, he says, I'm shaking as you are preaching. I've been blaming God for not answering my prayers. My friend, you are coming under the power of the Lord. And right now I take authority over every demonic spirit that has been afflicting you and leading you into depression and even pride leading to suicide. And I command it to leave you now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Father, thank you that every foul spirit that is tormenting Jamie, be gone in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I send you to the pit for your destruction right now. Suicide, go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. He's doing the work. I'm just preaching. This is the Lord. Now listen, don't get lost. I got lost. Where were we at? We're talking about... Um, Theology, yes, Jesus taught that there's an enemy. Why? Because people didn't know before. Jesus had to differentiate and said, look, I've come to bring life. The enemy comes to destroy and to steal and to kill. Now, you have to get this in your mind tonight. If there is stealing, killing, or destroying happening, it is not God. It is the only reason that the thief comes. And so this is how you never curse God. You recognize that when bad things happen to you, it is not God. The Bible says that God is working all things out for your good. Now, good might look different to you than it does to him. This is where trust is involved. Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know that you're working all things for my good. And so even though I'm tempted to question and to doubt and to wonder, I'm going to believe your word above my experience. I'm going to believe your word above my feelings. And I'm going to declare right now that I trust you even though I have no idea what you're doing. Because I know that you love me because you showed me that love on the cross. I know that you love me because I've seen you do this and that and this and that in my life. Begin to encourage yourself with testimonies. Remind yourself of what God has done. And then you see that the enemy is the one at work in your life and he's trying to get you to put the blame on God. Listen to how it has even infected our language. I have heard this teaching before. This is so powerful. Listen to this. What does the world say when they get mad? Oh, God damn it. God damn it. Oh, Jesus Christ. This is what the world says when they're mad. Who do you think taught them that language? Why is it in our language that it is God who damns when he has come to bring life and life more abundantly? Why is the name of our Lord and Savior used as a swear or, or something that people say when they're angry or when they get hurt or when they're frustrated? Why is that the name? Where did that language come from? Could it be that it is the enemy who is even subconsciously trying to get a world to look at God as the problem? I've got all these problems and he's the reason for it. Come on, have you ever thought about that? There is a master manipulator and deceiver at work 
Don't let him be at work in you one more night. Because you recognize every good and perfect thing comes from above. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why have I been blaming God for the trials in my life? Can I tell you something else? Trials are promised to you. You are not going to live a life without trials if you're a Christian. And if you do, I would wonder if you're actually a Christian. Here's why. Jesus promised that you would be persecuted. Jesus promised that you would go through trials in his name. If you don't get persecuted and you don't go through any trials, are you actually a Christian? Because if Jesus promised something, he doesn't break his word. Are you with me? 1 Peter 4 tells us that the world is going to think you're weird and they're going to make fun of you because you don't live like them. So if you have never been made fun of, either you're a secret Christian or you live just like everybody else and there's nothing for them to think is weird. Guys, I'm just shooting straight tonight because this is what's going to set us free. We have to be people that are living for God. And if you do live for God, uh, Mark Driscoll said it like this. He said, if you're going to stand up and call the shots, you're going to take the shots. And Christians, we stand up and we call the shots. We change environments. We say, no, Satan, not today. In the name of Jesus, we will not have pornographic books in our kids' school districts, in their libraries. No, in the name of Jesus. And we are changing culture. And guess what? When you're calling shots, you're going to take shots. But you have to be able to handle the war in your mind when the shots come. Because there are so many people who think as soon as any opposition comes their way, oh my gosh, where's God? How could he let this happen? Is God doing this? God, can you hear me? God, are you even real? I haven't heard you in a while. You haven't answered any of my prayers. I'm beginning to doubt this whole thing. Guys, do you think that I'm just making this scenario up? Or do you think that there are people maybe even on this live that have thought that way. Where God doesn't answer your prayers or the way that you want him to. And all of a sudden you begin to wonder, well, if God was really real, if God was really good, usually it starts there. If God was really good, then why would he let this happen? First, the enemy gets you to question his goodness. Then it goes, not just if God is good, because now you begin to wonder if God is good. And then you go, well, if God is real, then why would he allow this to happen to me? Let me tell you the stupidest question you could ever ask. And I'm saying it flat out like that because I wanna shock some of you who are listening. You, you grew up in school, I did, and they said, there's no stupid questions. No, there is one stupid question as a believer. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. God, why did you allow this? Why did God allow this to happen? Let me just tell you, that is a stupid question. And here is why. You will not get an answer. Okay? Why did God allow my father to die when we all prayed with him? Why did God allow this to happen? That's the wrong question. I was asking God about this a couple of months ago and I just said, Lord, what is the answer to this? Because people ask this question, how do I preach this? And he said, Shane, why do bad things happen? And I said, well, because of the enemy. And he says, okay, who allowed the enemy to have rights over humans? And I thought all the way back to the garden. Why does Satan have the right to mess with you tonight? Because of Adam and Eve. Think about this. God is perfect and he's amazing. Guys, stick with me. We're almost done here. I know it's been a little while, but this is important. God is perfect and he's amazing. He's a wonderful provider and father. He gave mankind 
Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion. He gave them authority over everything, the whole earth. He made animals be afraid of them. That means they could have walked up to a buffalo and not worried about getting trampled. They could have walked up to an alligator or a snake and not worried about getting bit or eaten. They had fear. The, the, the Bible says that animals were afraid. They have reverence for humans. This was God's original design. He gave us everything. And Adam and Eve took that and they gave it to the enemy. They gave Satan dominion. And Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. Satan has authority over the earth now because man gave it to him. So the story of the Bible is God redeeming what Adam and Eve did through Jesus Christ. And so as a born again Christian, you are no longer under the law of sin and death because of Adam and Eve. You are under the law of eternal life and grace in Jesus Christ. But you can still hear the voice of the enemy. You can still be touched by the enemy, but he can't touch your soul. I wanna ask you tonight, is your soul more important to you than your earthly body? Because there are people that ask questions that put their soul in the balance because their earthly body or their earthly life is being crushed. And look, I get it, it's tough, life is hard. But as a believer, I'm telling you, there is nothing that is gonna make me question God. And I've been through a lot. I've almost lost my life. My wife almost lost her life. I was almost murdered in 2020. Like, I'm not preaching this as some guy. I'm not some influencer that's just like giving you a message. Like, I've walked this thing out. I've been to war. I've almost been killed as a police officer. You can't preach like this for seven years and not go through some life. Like, I'm speaking with a little bit of authority right now. I walk this out every day, and that's not a prideful thing. I'm telling you from confidence, you can overcome because I used to be suicidal. I used to deal with PTSD. I used to be severely depressed, and now I'm not. So don't mistake my confidence in the Lord to deliver me as arrogance because it's not because I never could have done this by myself. But now I know who I am. I know my identity in Jesus Christ and I can say, I will not deny you, Lord. I've learned from Peter's mistake. I will not deny the Lord at the cost of my own comfort or my life. And I wanna ask you tonight, if you're honest with yourself, are you Peter right now? Do you say that, Lord, I'll do anything for you, but when push comes to shove, you begin to doubt, question, and try to save your own skin? That will cause your mind to just spin because you feel guilty. You feel like you've betrayed the Lord, or maybe you're in a different position. Maybe you have confessed and you believe and you're trying to walk with the Lord, but you have not obeyed the word of God, which says to take every thought captive. You have been lazy. You have gotten fatigued from war, from the spiritual war. You've gotten fatigued. And so you've taken yourself out of the fight and you've allowed these thoughts to pile up. And now you're at a place where not only do you maybe not even wanna be here anymore, you're, you're not even sure about God. I'm calling you back into the fight right now. I'm calling you to get back in and be a joyful fighter. Because you see, this life is not all about me and how awesome can life be and how much can I be blessed? That's not what it's about. It's not like, how big of a following can I get and how many things can I speak at and how much money? That's a zero. It's, Lord, how much can you be glorified through my life? I want to finish with this to give you a little perspective. I've got a, a long time. He was a mentor when I was uh, coming up in Army ROTC in college here in Florida. He was a legend in the military. He won the best ranger competition, uh, which is an extremely difficult competition to even complete, let alone win. 
He is, he's a hero. I mean, he's been in so many wars and he and his wife were missionaries to Haiti after he got out of the military and did some things locally. And while he was in Haiti, uh, an, there was an attempted kidnapping of him and his family and he got shot and paralyzed. Now his family got away. He was able, they were able to drive the car away, but he's paralyzed now. It's horrific. And he's back in the States. And do you know what the nurses and the doctors and everyone says? One, man, there's such a presence when I walk into your room. What is that? Two, they say, we have never met someone who has so much peace and joy in your situation in our lives. What is happening to you? Now I want you to think about this. A guy who has given his life with his family to be a missionary in a third world country. A guy who has served his country diligently and nobly and just with excellence. He has done everything right and then he gets paralyzed because of some evil men. Now he has every right to wonder, God, why didn't you? And where were you? And why didn't you know I'm trying to do this work for you? At least you could protect me. Why couldn't you heal me? Why couldn't you prevent this from happening? He didn't do that. You know what he said when I talked to him? He said, look, I don't understand everything, but I know that God is working all things out and he's got a greater plan than I do. And now I'm in this situation and now I can minister from this place because I can still talk. That is the perspective of someone who is dead to self and alive in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, the war in his mind, he's winning it because he's not waking up thinking, well, poor me, and here I am again in this wheelchair, and blah, blah, blah. No. He's waking up and saying, Lord, how can I shine for you today? Now, you could be honest with God and say, man, you know what? I never thought I'd end up here, and this isn't what I would have chosen, but I'm here now. And I know that this life, wisp, vapor, here today, gone tomorrow. So God, while I'm here on the earth, don't let me waste a moment. How can you use me to bring yourself glory? Come on, guys, this is possible. So tonight, it's time for you to make a decision. The first thing I'm gonna tell you is that you cannot overcome the war in your mind in your own flesh. You have to have the Holy Spirit. And if you are not a born-again Christian, if you're not following Jesus, then you don't have a spirit. And not only are you going to lose the war in your mind, but you will spend eternity separated from God. You have to be born again. The Bible says you must be born again. And so if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ tonight, if you need to be made a new creation, if you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and and receive eternal life so that you could begin to walk out the life that Jesus paid for you to walk out, This is about so much more than avoiding going to hell when you die. No, Jesus didn't die to just keep you from hell. He died so that you could become his child and that you could live a life that he paid for you to live. And if you need that tonight, I want you to say yes, Jesus, in the comments. Wherever you're at, if you're watching on YouTube later or you're watching live now, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, whether you've been a confessing Christian going to church on Sundays, but you know you're not living for the Lord or whether you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or maybe you're coming back after 20 years, it doesn't matter. Just say yes, Jesus. Look at these comments, guys. You can't see on YouTube, but there are so many just flooding in right now. There's seven, eight, nine people. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord God. 10, thank you, Jesus. Now listen, while these friends are confessing and acknowledging that they need to be made new, some of you who have taken yourself out of the fight, you've been weary, you've been fatigued, and you've heard this message tonight and you've said, you know what, I'm ready to get back in. I'm ready to to not allow the enemy to keep me on the sidelines anymore. I'm not gonna blame God for my circumstances. I'm gonna run to him. 
If that's you and you're saying, look, I am ready tonight to stop letting the enemy eat my lunch every day. I'm ready to stop letting the enemy run my life with his lies and his accusations. I'm ready to stop listening to the lies of the enemy and letting them just sit in my head. I will be a Christian who holds on to truth and who takes every thought captive and who exalts truth above circumstance, who exalts truth above how I'm feeling. If that's you tonight, I want you to say, that's me. That's me. And you're saying this even to yourself, you're just saying, look, I'm ready to turn over a new leaf. I'm ready to, to go all in for Jesus. I'm not gonna be driven by emotions anymore. I'm not gonna be driven by the ups and downs of life. I'm gonna be driven by the word of life, which is the Bible. I'm gonna go all in for the Bible. Yeah, there's a lot of people saying that's me now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, listen, you can do it. Hear me, you can do this. You can live this life. Jesus paid for you to live it, you can live it. Now I'm gonna say a prayer over all of us, but before I do that, if you enjoyed this message, if this spoke to you, or if this type of teaching you feel like could really help you, you've got to check out the mentorship group that I launched last week. We already have over 27 people signed up in the group chat right now. There's a daily chat on the Discord app, which is like a texting app. There is a weekly Zoom call where I lead discussions, I teach, I preach. It's exclusive to the mentorship group. We do discussions, question and answer, stuff like that. And we've got events that we're going to be planning in the future. It's going to be incredible. But listen, if you need help, if you need uh, discipleship, if you need mentorship, if you need someone to walk with you digitally, you know, this is all online. So your expectations need to understand that it's digital, but we've got people praying for each other and, and we've got a great discussion going on in the chat right now. We've got that Zoom call that happens every Monday night. It's so powerful. If you are interested in being a part of our Overcomers Mentorship Group, you need to send me a DM after this live and just say the word overcomer and I will get you more information, okay? If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment, overcomer, and I will get you more information. If you wanna join our mentorship group, uh, we'd love to have you. So let me pray to wrap this thing up and uh, we'll be done for tonight. I hope it blessed you. I hope that um, you took something away from this and that you will no longer let food, lies, sit on the pan of your mind. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you have not left us empty-handed. You did not leave us to fight a spiritual war without armor. You have given us spiritual armor. And God, I pray that from tonight forward, we would be people who use that spiritual armor. Lord, that we would take every thought captive, not most, not some thoughts captive, but Lord, help empower us and remind us to take every thought captive that exalts itself against you. And would we bring it down and make it obedient to you in the name of Jesus? God, would we be a people, and I pray over these friends who are listening now, would you be a people who exalt the word of God above your circumstances? Would you be a people who exalt the word of God and the Bible over your feelings, over your desires, over your wants and needs? Would you have reverence for God and his word above your experience? And God, above all, would we never allow the lies and the trials and the fires from the enemy cause us to turn away from you. Lord, we ask you to help us to stay on the narrow path. I pray for every person tonight that you would speak to them, lead them, and guide them. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen, guys. Thank you for watching. Again, you want to join the Overcomers Mentorship Group, send me a message. Overcomers, I'll get you more info. See you next Wednesday.